such a small group, I didn't want to use the mic, but they're, they're recording, so here we go, all right? Um, but anyhow, I'm glad to be here. I was telling Pastor Paul the reason why I came back was because, so I felt the last time I was here for ambassadors, I just kind of stirred the pot a little bit, and all I did was say, hey, let's consider what church planting is about, and in particular for second generation. You know, the title, I don't know if you guys, if some of you guys were there, but the title that I gave was actually Courageous Church Planting, and I want to begin by just saying that I do think that idea of courage is lacking sometimes for us as a generation, the, the confidence that we have. And actually, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit in my slides, but um, th this verse came to mind even as I was preparing for this. If God is for us, who can be against us? And the promise of the gospel that we think through this idea that how, how do we walk confidently, right, and knowing that even if God is, is really for us, right, our aspirations about church planting, that we can kind of walk in a sense of courage and confidence. That was the verse I had last time in terms of just keeping in mind. I'm going to kind of build off of that. And just hope that, you know, you have a desire, hopefully, to say the same exact thing. If I know that God is for me, then in aspirations for church planting, for the same reason, like, what can really be against us? And so, you know, for me, I'm always probably on the side of being overly encouraging to say, hey, people, if you have an inkling toward church planting, like, go for it. It's something that God can do in your life and for the sake of the kingdom. But all that to say is this. Let me just pause and have us um, somewhat introduce ourselves. And then when, when we introduce ourselves, if you guys can, why don't you talk about a little bit of your exposure to church planting and kind of where you think your future might land with that. Does that make sense? So just introduce who you are, and then uh, we can kind of go around and also talk about our exposure to the church plan or our thoughts about it, why you're here at the seminar, what drew you here. That'd be great. Okay? So I'm going to start with Pastor James, and we'll just go around. I'm going to give you the mic, too. All right. Uh, I'm James. Um, I, uh, I guess we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm actually in transition right now in terms of ministry. Uh, and in terms of why I'm here, my, 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 uh, my brother Joe here asked me to come with him, and uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm obviously I know I know Pastor Robert. Um, I think it's been a great time uh, to hear his thoughts. Uh, but in terms of church planting, you know, I've known a lot of brothers who've planted, and and, and you know, uh, my friends and I we always talk about it, and that's something that um, I don't know if that's a call that ha God has for me, but it's something that I've always thought about. Even go to different areas and talk to different people, and be like, wow, like. You know, you know, you know, there's definitely a need here, and so we always pray to God, like, you know, is this a place where maybe we can, you know, plant a church? And there's a, there's a scariness to that. There's an exciting aspect of, you know, we are planting here. And I remember even in seminary, uh, professors like Manuel Cruz would really encourage us to plan and just all the good parts of it, all just the upsides of it. And so, you know, I've been praying about it in my life, especially as I'm in transition about what God wants me to do. And so I feel like this would be helpful to think through it and pray through it a little bit more. Hi everyone, um, I'm Joe. I'm currently pastoring at a uh, at a church called Redeemer uh, West Side in New York City. Um, I'm here to hear Robert. Um, I met I met I met you at uh, General Assembly uh, for our denomination PCA. Um, my exposure to church planting was um, I, I always wanted to church plant. Um, I always felt I had a an entrepreneurial spirit. I liked trying new stuff. And, uh, you know, obviously being kind of part of Redeemer uh, for a while now, Tim Keller is all about, you know, church planting. And, and, and so I always thought about church planting, but uh, I, I live in uh, northern New Jersey right now in Bergen County uh, where there's a lot of second-generation Korean-Americans. And um, I, you know, I definitely felt uh, that there's a need there uh, for a church for uh, folks there that are not church. And so I've been praying and thinking about, um, you know, whether – uh, God may be leading me in that direction. So I'm seeing today as another step uh, towards discerning God's call uh, on my life and on my family's life uh, towards church planning. So excited to be here. Uh, my name is Edward. Um, to be honest, uh, <laughs> uh, my senior pastor strongly encouraged me to come here twice. So if he asked me twice, then it's pretty poor. <laughs> so I, I obeyed and I'm here. Um, some of my friends have planted churches, and so I, I have been exposed to it. Um, but personally, I had no strong desire to plant one or was ever exposed to a seminar like this. But uh, I'm excited to see what God's going to stir in my heart. And maybe he wants me to do something that I never even thought of before. So I'm here. I'm serving as a youth pastor under my senior pastor here, Pastor Daniel. Um, and, yeah, just wanna, I'm just excited just like you to see what God has to tell me today. Hello. My name is Josh. Um, my desires for church planning. Well, I mean, I'm 16, so 
you know, I've never had the thought of planning a church. My main, um, I guess my main desire or ever since, um, well, my prayer has always been for God to just do whatever he wants with my life and, and work through it. So um, same as my youth pastor, Pastor Ed, and um, I, was, I was encouraged to come by our senior pastor, Pastor Daniel, and um, yeah, <laughs> so... So I guess um, I'm, I'm just here to uh, experience it. I've never been to a seminar like this either. And um, I'm, I'm also excited to be here and, and just see um, whatever God wants to do in my life and just be willing to follow through with it and do whatever he wants me to do. Hi, uh, my name is Daniel. And me and my wife, we, we prayed about church planting uh, for about a year, but God didn't just open the door. Instead, he led us to uh, pastor um, a Korean congregation in Brooklyn where I grew up. Um, so that's my home church. So I'm serving there as a youth pastor, I mean, a senior pastor now. Uh, I don't think I'm a church planter. I, I thought about it. I wanted to be one, but I don't think that's the path that God has formed me. But instead, I brought Pastor Eddie and Josh. I think one day God will be using them uh, to plant churches, I believe. And <laughs> as for us, we need to, we're praying for um, the EM ministry to begin. We're praying about it and and ask God how, how to go about it. So today I hope to learn a lot from Pastor Rob and your experience, and I want to thank you for having us. Hello, I'm Tim. I'm currently um, working uh, as a pharmacist, and I just started a seminary last year, going part-time in South Carolina, uh, CIU, um, and serve as a youth, um, youth pastor, so for a little over a year now. So um, last at the Ambassadors Conference, I met Pastor Robert and um, gave a seminar on church planting. It was really good and helpful. So just came to learn and w with the hope and prospect of one day um, perhaps doing it, being a part of a, uh, a church plant. Yeah. Hi, my name is Dan. Um, I'm an uh, aspiring pastor. Um, and I'm here today, um, the relation with church planting. I've been part of a church plant um, that has ups and downs. It actually didn't work out so well. But I have a lot of other pastoral friends who are serving and who are doing church plant. And I think for me, initially, church planting was what really inspired me to want to become a pastor. Um, things can change. I don't know what God will call me at the very end. But right now, I'm just trying to observe and learn in all different capacities so I can be prepared if God was to call me in that position one day. Um, so, yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Sarah, and I go to New York. Um, I'm also working as a pharmacist now. And um, I haven't actually had much exposure with church planting, but I just came to hear and learn more. And if this is, um, I guess, the path that God that God is taking um, our church um, to do in the future, then that's something that I definitely want to think about, pray about, and um, hopefully uh, take part in as well. So, yeah, that's all I have. Hi, my name is Jonah. Um, I'm about to start college. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, or I uh, will plan on going to into the ministry uh, later on. Uh, once I finish school, um, and uh, yeah, I'm just here to learn more, um, see if this is a potential uh, place where God is calling me into, uh, and just, yeah, think about things like this, yeah. Uh, Paul Chung, uh, planned the church New Heart nine years ago, eight and a half years ago, and yeah, I'm hoping to uh, if Lord allows, uh, plant the church with a very different format uh, without Korean congregation attached. Perhaps, uh, Lord willing, um, North Vietnamese congregation here in New York. And we really do pray that many churches will be planted in Queens and New York. So, it's so excited to have that. Thank you. Let me just comment really quick on the youthfulness. Uh, so in the PCA, one of the things we just uh, started uh, was something called the Antioch Fund. And part of the Antioch, I think it's the Antioch Fund. But it was actually a desire to actually start 
the seed of church planting at a younger age. And actually, literally, the conversations are going on. There's going to the youth groups of America and start actually telling the youth, hey, you can at one point be a church planter. So this is actually literally an idea that we've been floating, we've been working on it, trying to fund it, and actually it's great to see you young bucks uh, hopefully have this idea that basically we're saying let's create a farm system for church planters, that let's get them early, let's get them with the vision with that in mind. So let me just kind of quickly tell my journey. So, um, really, sorry, I gotta go back. So here's my family. I'm originally from California. Um, I was originally a missions guy, and so all I wanted to do was go overseas on missions when I went to seminary. Uh, I was a young, energetic, you know, aspiring guy, et cetera, and things like that. And all I wanted to do was go and do missions. Like, it was one of the thing, greatest things about telling someone for the first time, here's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and for them to respond. And there was such a beauty to that. And then maybe about, you know, 15 or so years ago, um, there was a dramatic shift in my call. Because literally, my whole life was planned toward overseas missions. And the long story short, kind of the Lord revealed in a weird story. It was actually, it's funny, I was driving up with Dan, and I was talking about revitalization, but I was at a seminar with Harry Reader, who's all about church revitalization. He shared a story. I'm going to go quick, but here we go. He shows a story about um, a church that at one point had, a, let's say, a $10,000 missions budget. And so long story short, they said, hey, as an elder board, let's think about what we're going to spend this money with. So one elder said, hey, there's John Doe. He's a great guy. We want to send him over to Africa for missions. And so he was like, I'm all for this. But the rest of the elders, not because they didn't like the guy, said, hey, you know what, what about if instead of investing in, you know, that one guy who can go overseas, let's invest in a missions awareness program. And so they said, let's spend $10,000 and kind of just invite missionaries, bring in this awareness in our church about what's going on around the world. And so they did that. After that one year, they had like 20 people commit themselves to full-time overseas missions. And the story really resonated with my life in terms of saying, like, yeah, I could be that one John Doe who goes over to Africa or wherever country in mind and be that one person, or I could be someone that raises up, right, future leaders, pastors, et cetera, and things like that, and kind of create movements, if that makes sense. So when that happened, that dramatically shifted my call, where I began to realize as much as there is a missions field overseas, there indeed was a great mission field here. And so when I pursued a call, the call I pursued was actually to plant churches. And so of all places from California to Philadelphia, I did come to Philadelphia, and there are days in which I wake up, and if you guys know the contrast between Orange County, in particular Huntington Beach, California, to Philadelphia, there are days in which I wake up, I feel like I'm in a foreign country, <laughs> right? I mean, it's literally like you're like the smells, the sounds, the entire thing, the food they eat, it's very different, right? The TV they watch, everything about it feels different. And it's kind of cool because I do wake up sometimes feeling like, you know what? As much as I would wake up when I was in Kazakhstan on missions, hearing the sounds of Muslims praying at 6 a.m. in the morning, or 6 in the morning, it's the same feeling I get when I wake up in Philadelphia that I'm on mission. And it's been fun to kind of see how that plays in with planting churches because, again, it's the same spirit of mind. So when I think about my church, when I think about Grace Point North, when I think about church planting, this is what really drives me, right? It drives me to this understanding to say, again, that there is indeed a mission field out there. So, uh, again, before I go too fast and ahead of myself, uh, let me hope these things work. That was the verse that we gave you. Uh, sorry, I'm going to give this as a quick resource. This is how we're going to try to spend our time. And again, I'm going to go quick, but here's this bit lie, right, or whatever, however you pronounce it, bit.ly, bit lie, whatever. Um, but I want to encourage you. So all the resources, including the PowerPoint, are there for your, for your download. Um, there's also going to be a bunch of sample church proposals. There's also the videos that I'm going to share. If we watch them, we may not watch them all. If you guys had uh, a, a Internet access, you could get on it. I will say this. I had three copies, and so if anyone wants a copy, there's three copies up here um, for your reference in terms of those of you guys who like paper copies. You're more than willing to take it. Otherwise, they're just going to sit there. So any one of you guys can take those copies. All right. So um, there's one for each session. Sorry, I only have one copy of each session. So that's session two. That's session three. This is session one. My apologies. So it's okay. He took session one. <laughs> but they're there for your reference. Um, and again, if you want me to email more resources as well, I have a ton of resources just to be able to give you. I'm more than willing to share those with you at all possible. So again, let me just begin with scripture by saying this, right? So the other verse that kind of has guided me, and I want to just begin with scripture, is, is again, this whole premise of Matthew 9, 37, 38. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And again, the last time I came to New York, I will say this, I did feel this innate sense of being able to say, you know what, New York needs more churches. And I will say this, I mean, you know, you look at churches like Redeemer, et cetera, and things of the such, the harvest is plentiful. And again, the same thing that we would say in regards to what I said about, like, going overseas and, and going up to someone that never knew the gospel. And you're saying, you know what, I can, I can introduce you. And again, you're not doing the work, but you're sharing the gospel. And to see kind of new life form, it's the same thing that's happening here. 
we just have to open our eyes to see really in essence the harvest that's there. And I remember this even early on, so kind of my early conversion experience, I came to Christ my junior year of high school, and I just started going out and doing street evangelism. So I went out on the pier, right, the Honey Beach Pier. And so I would go there and I would just talk to people and I'd say, hey, have you ever heard of Jesus Christ? That was oftentimes my introduction. I kind of got better. I was maybe a little too upfront, but anyhow, cold turkey evangelist just going and saying, have you ever heard of Jesus? And it was just fascinating because even then, right, and this is, you know, roughly early 90s, people were like, no, I've never heard who is this guy. And just being able to share was amazing. But again, you fast forward 20 years, it's even starker now because we know that there's less churches, right? And so the need for workers, and here's the beautiful thing, again, just like a harvest, and actually just for fun, we did a garden in our house. Um, it's been fun to see and say, you know what, like, when a harvest comes, it just comes like no other. Like, we planted these uh, 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 green beans, right? And green beans are easy to grow, just as an FYI. So here you go, we plant green beans in our garden. And it's funny, my daughter is the one that goes and harvests it. But she comes back every single day with, like, a whole handful. We can't even eat enough because it just keeps coming. And that's kind of great when you think about how scripturally speaking, right, Jesus speaks of the mission field. And I would say this in regards to church plant. But there's this huge harvest. To me, New York City or New York Metro, greater New York Metro area, is this giant harvest field. And, you know, I have often used this as an illustration, but just to make sure we get it, and actually, Joe, let me ask you this question. How, Redeemer has a total combined number of people. How many members or people come on an average basis? What would you say? Okay, so six to 7,000, roughly, okay? In a city, roughly, of six million. Okay? That's tiny. And again, they're doing great work. There's, there's no discredit to the work that Redeemer is doing. But there's a great reminder, right, when we think about the significance of the mission field. The mission field is insanely huge. And again, you can do all the work about city development in terms of how God is moving people into the cities, how over time, majority of the people will live in the cities and not in the suburbs and the result of what that means. But it means that there's a significant need for churches in the city. And so my hope, even for this conference, is for you all, especially in this New York metro area, is that you catch a vision to be able to say, you know what, we can do this for the rest of our life. And we won't turn the tide because there's that much work to do. And so, again, if you ask me a question, if there's a young, aspiring leader, Josh, you could be one of these guys, but if there's a young, aspiring leader saying, hey, you know, am I ever going to, do I have the ability to, I'm going to say, go for it. Not to say we're going to talk about call later, but go for it. Why? Because the need is so great. Let me move forward, right? So uh, you've heard this been said, A. Gibbs, in his book, The Church is Always One Generation Away from Extinction. Some of this is a repeat. I just wanted to recap some of the things I said last time when I was here. But this idea, I think, is all the more true about Korean Americans, right? And so this is true about every generation, but in particular about Korean Americans, we know this. We sense this, right? I mean, a couple of senior pastors here, but they will say this, right, in terms of the first-generation church. The first-generation church right now is in decline. I can give other positive theories. That's why I said last time. One of the reasons why they're in decline, in my opinion, is because they didn't catch the understanding of what it means to be a missional church, what it means to be on mission. They were a product of a generation that was able to receive and not an ability to actually go and do mission. Right? We could talk about planting new churches. This is Peter Wagner, planting new churches is the most effective evangelistic methodology known under heaven. Um, and so we know this to be true, right? See Patrick, Peter Wagner's kind of comment, right? The be- most effective way to actually go and evangelize the people is to actually get new churches. There's all different dynamics, right? Like Keller talks about this idea of planting new churches reaches new believers. Again, this is going quick. It's all on your PowerPoint. You can get it later. But you get the idea, right? We, I mentioned this last time in terms of resources, man- mission fields, men, women, momen- money, and momentum. I'm going to go through this quick because this isn't actually all of it. This is all a recap. Um, leadership culture. I will say these things are important when we think about Korean Americans and some of the dynamics we face. And I, this is from a different seminar I gave, but I, I do think this is important. For second generation, we have a particular leadership culture that needs to be challenged. And what I mean by that is um, we have leaders that are oftentimes underdeveloped to the positions in which we are in. So case in point, right, I was 20, 20 when I started seminary. And so when I started doing youth ministry, I was a 20-year-old leader. Okay, keep keep that in mind. So I was largely underdeveloped. And I will say this, that over time, those underdeveloped aspects continue to show. So when we think about leadership culture, we have these issues, right? So as a 20-year-old, I had to face aspects of, oh, you look too young, right? This idea of our face, right, that we had to save a particular image. And just to make sure we're freed a little bit to this understanding, I, I do think the gospel frees us to be who we are in Christ. Does that make sense? And oftentimes, sometimes in the church, actually, I just spoke on this um, yesterday or on Sunday at church, but we take kind of a Pharisaic mentality of, you know, the outside is clean, but the inside is very dirty. And I will say that, problematically speaking, for us as a generation of leaders, we need to make sure that our culture, right, begins to change. 
um, occupation, things that we go after, Christian liberty, our understanding of what that means, and race and ethnicity, that we're actually in a time where we know race relations actually matters. And that's been highlighted, right, with all the contemporary issues today. Believe it or not, as Asian Americans or either of minorities, we're going to face interesting aspects of what that is. I mean, I'll tell you really quick, just kind of forthright. Um, I've turned down certain positions because I've actually said this very literally to the person. I said, because Asian Americans are not welcome in these leadership positions yet. And I said, they will be over time, but not yet. And my point was, not that I wasn't cap capable of such things, but understanding what, what a race right now plays in in terms of leadership dynamics, right? Um, so here, now we're actually going straight to the idea of church planting. So what is church planting? And it's the question that ultimately you're thinking about, well, what is it actually that we're trying to kind of stab at today? So church planning is the deliberate multiplication of worshiping congregate congregations motivated by a desire to mobilize believers on missions to reach the lost in their community and add new disciples to the church in obedience to the Great Commission. And again, as simple as that might be, it, it forms with your understanding of what is church, right? Which is to say that it's a gather, right? So the word church is ecclesia in Greek. What does that mean? It's the called out. So when we think about, for example, the world in which we live in, you guys can take New York Metro as an area, right? Six million people. Well, of that six million people, there's the church. And by the way, just I'll, I'll give some things. So, um, uh, shoot, um, Harvey Kahn, there we go, at Westman. I really loved how he, he talked about this idea that in the book of Revelations, when he wrote, when, when John writes to the churches, for example, at Philadelphia, it's always fun to use that one because I'm in Philadelphia, that he's not referencing a singular church. Right? Harvey Kahn had this perspective that when he's writing those letters, he's actually writing to the multiple churches that make up that one body. And so when you have a vision of the church, you're actually saying, well, what is the church in New York, right? As we think about the church unified, you can use the Apostles' Creed, right? I believe in the holy Catholic church. What does that mean for you? And how does that propel your vision to say, you know what? It's not just if one church is doing well and all the other churches suck. It's the fact that we want all the churches to be flourishing. We want every man, woman, and child in the city of New York and the greater area to be able to have access to the gospel. The response, not up to you. It's all God and his providence and his sovereignty. But that they would have a gospel outpost so that really, in essence, the gospel can be heard and preached and every man, woman, and child can be seen. Does that make sense? And you think about that, right? Like that's where a, a formulation of, and I will say this, a formulation of your ecclesiology ties into your missiology which is to say, again, what you believe the church to be ties into how you believe that church should actually go on. When you think about that for yourselves, I think it's important, which is to ask kind of this question. If you were to be asked, or if you were asked to defend church planning from the Bible, to what text would you turn? So here's believe it or not is interesting. There are some people in the church, and this is unfortunate, because some people will say, oh, why plant more churches? Don't you know there's already existing churches out there? So you tell me. I'm going to ask you just for fun, turn to the audience. What would you say are biblical reasons to go and plant more churches? This is audience participation. Asian Americans aren't good at this, by the way. And to me, the primary basis is exactly that, which is actually the Great Commission, right? And so you know, this whole idea, I mean, we could go to other texts as well. I could argue in terms of even looking at the Apostle Paul's ministry, but to me, the Great Commission is the, the biggest, right? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the way, even in the Great Commission, if you, if you look at that, there actually is an a, a ecclesiological aspect to the Great Commission. It's not actually just going and sharing the gospel. It's actually the whole idea of baptism, right, which again was a mode of sacrament done in the local church, right, ties into our understanding that it's actually very ecclesiological, that the church is tied to the Great Commission as well. Um, so here, church planning in the apostolic age. So, um, by the way, I need to give credit where credit is due. So uh, Dr. Bruce Finn, who teaches over at Westman, actually teaches a class on church planning. I asked him, I said, hey, I'm doing this seminar up in New York. Could you kind of give me some help and some guidelines? You know, I'm trying to do these things, and he knows my passion. He's actually one of the guys that, you know, mentors me, et cetera, and things like that. So he gave me a bunch of his stuff that he's doing. So some of the stuff is coming from him. Um, but I just want to kind of tie this to that. Some of the ones were done that were good. You can actually tell the difference, by the way. He's a little bit older. So his, uh, his graphic skills are a little bit different than mine. But here we go, right? So he would argue this, right? So if we look at the apostolic age, basically uh, this is how they did church planning, the sequence of the events, right? So prayer, evangelism, community leadership, and multiplication. 
He said, if you look at church planning, this is exactly how they did it. And it's important, right, because we see the sequence of events. I will challenge you that I think there are aspects in which, indeed, we need to continue to think through and say, hey, what does that look like? But here's the his point, right? Here's what we tend to do well when we think about church planning, right? We tend to do community and leadership. So oftentimes when we think about modern-day church planting, we think for ourselves, like, yeah, this is what we need. We have that entrepreneurial aspect. We need to gather a community, and we need to do leadership. And, and again, we're going to talk about those as being significant and important. But at the same time, what he also reminds us of is saying this. He says that we cannot forget these other three, which is, again, prayer, evangelism, community, and in particular, multiplication. And by the way, so if you go back really quick, so the two things that we're missing, right? Uh, or, sorry. Ah, there we go. So the two things that were missing from that previous slide were prayer, evangelism, and multiplication. Now, what, what his point in teaching this is saying this, is oftentimes when people think about church planting, if you're thinking about this in, New York, in the greater New York area, what you can't say to yourself is, okay, what I want to do and inspire to do is actually go and gather people, and I want to be a great pastor and a great leader. He says if you lack your ability to actually do it, as the, we see it done in the apostolic movement, this idea of saying, well, soak it in prayer, be motivated by this understanding of evangelism because it's actually reaching the lost. It's actually going and sharing the gospel with people who do not have access to the gospel. And even with this further vision of saying, you know what, if you do it once, again, let me do this with New York. If you just build one church, you're not going to turn the tide. But you create movements to be able to say, you know what, how do we multiply? How do we make it a movement so that it's not just one, right, but it's two? For example, I'm going to tell you at Grace Point, and this is funny, because the Pastor Paul is our church planter. He's in a, he's, uh, actually, this month is, uh, is one year for them, and God has been gracious to them. They've grown. They've, um, you know, they're becoming more sustainable, et cetera, and things like that. But long story short, I continue to remind, as I did day one, I was like, Paul, at some point or another, we're going to go from one to two, two to four. Even at your first year, I want you to begin to pray about whatever the, your next place is going to be. I already gave him a site. I told him, King of Prussia, go there, plant there. It's awesome. It's ready, right? You already have all the resources, et cetera, and things like that. Go for it. Well, us, we're, we're now beginning to pray about Cherry Hill, New Jersey, about saying, hey, what would it look like for us to plant in a different area? And that's my vision, right? This idea of multiplication, that we don't lose out on the sense of saying, you know what, if you just do it once, it's not going to turn. But it's this idea of, of gospel multiplication. It's this idea of, even in the great, the understanding of, of our of human call, right, be fruitful and multiply. I, I think singularly as churches in the same exact way, it's that same aspect, be fruitful and multiply, right? Um, it's if as long as, if as God would permit it, that we would actually do so. Um, some of these are old stats, so I'm going to just kind of go fly by these. You know that churches are closing. They're closing more than they are opening. This is just really kind of quick. The number of churches are in decline. The population is in in incline. And so what does that mean for us, right? It means that, again, we need to plant more churches. The fact of the matter is the growth of churches, right, we're not outpacing the growth of the population. And that's going to be problematic. You know this, right? Actually, one of our guys at our church just came back from Japan. And the problem with Japan is what? Their population declined because they're not having enough children compared to their, uh, the population that's declined. So as a result, their future is in somewhat despair. Same thing with the church in America. We know this to be true. But let me kind of just highlight a little bit for us as Korean Americans, uh, for, those, for the Korean American church. We know this to be all the more true about Korean Americans because why? Because we're even at, at a greater risk because why? Because we have the number of churches on a decline, and I say this because we see more churches, even Korean churches, on a decline, and yet we see even the number of people in the churches in that same exact way declining. Why? Not because we're not seeing second generation have more children, et cetera, and things like that, but because this. Because the reality is that immigration is at an all-time low. Right? Now, there's a lot of factors as to why Koreans are not immigrating anymore, and this is what I was saying earlier about the Korean church needs to gain a missional understanding. But they're no longer the inherited, they, they can't inherit this idea that there's an immigration slope. So case in point, I'll give you this example. So when we came out of our mother church, and so just a quick go backtrack of our story. So I was called at KUC, which was uh, one of the largest Presbyterian churches in Philadelphia at the time. Um, and I was called as a church planner. So make sure you know that I, I didn't create any kind of division, et cetera, things like that. I was literally called to be the church planner. And so, long story short, we go forward, et cetera, and things like that. Um, where was I going with this? Um, so I was called as a, as a church planner. So my task was literally to go and plant a church. Um, oh, I'm losing my thought. I hate when I do this when I'm speaking. But here we go. So uh, we're, we're going to plant this church. Oh, population decline. Here we go. And, and so we're, we're going to plant this church. And, and as a result, what I told the, uh, the, uh, the 
the, con- or the, the mother church when we eventually left, they were like, hey, you know, if you leave, well, we're not going to send you our youth group kids anymore. So that was a threat for us. But all that to say is this. Our congregation kind of took a response and said, like, hey, yeah, Pastor Rob, you're right. Like, if we lose, we're no longer going to inherit, right, graduating youth group students to come into our ministry. Does that make sense? And I would argue this as a thought, and you can, you can have some fun with this later. You can ask me questions. I think English ministries, even in the same exact way, the same kind of model mindset of kind of being attractional or come to me versus go and out and do mission is the same thing that has been largely attributed to the fact that it has stunted our ability to do church as God intended it to be. Let me, if, you, if it doesn't make sense, let me say it this way. So EMs are, are, have largely relied upon even this fact that by attrition, by everyone getting older, they think, well, the church will grow, but not because they did ministry well because they simply had an attractional thing, you will just come to us. But that can't be the case, right? And the thing is, what I said to our church is, you're right, we're no longer gonna have that. And you know what the onus of that means then? The onus of that means is that we actually have to be the church now. We actually have to go on mission. You actually have to be bold and courageous to actually reach out now to your, your classmates, your school work, your, your coworkers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You actually have to go on mission now. I said, you were largely right, blessed with the fact that you inherited, but we no longer have that anymore. So again, other reasons. Let me kind of go through these quick. Actually, do you want me to pause? I'm going too fast? Are you good? good? Good speed? All right, here we go. Um, so rapid immigration. What are some other factors that are kind of uh, diving into this fact, right? So what we see is other reasons to why we should church plant from every nation, right? New York of any area. You guys see this, right? Literally, nations are here. Uh, you probably can't even count the number of nations that are there. I, I'll tell you one of the coolest stories, right? And it's funny because actually my son back there said, hey, Dad, do you know anyone from Oven? And it was cool because one day at church at Grace Point, right, we're near Arcadia University, which has a huge student exchange program. Omen, right, the country in Africa has less than 1% Christian. But anyhow, this one girl came, and she was just like, her eyes were wide struck because she was like, I'm in a church. And I knew it when she came in. She was like, if I wasn't in a church, then I would be and how cool it is that even a tiny church like us in Philadelphia, that the nations are there, right? And again, what we understand, uh, and oftentimes, again, just to make sure you see this, the people that are here that are from those nations realize who they are. Like this girl from Omen is, you know, the elite of the elite. Because why? Because she's able to come here, study in a foreign country, et cetera, and probably will be able to go back. And if you get her here, hey, you do missions. And by the way, just to make sure you know, that satisfies my missions desire. I just got back from a trip from Cuba. And every time I go on mission trips, I'm always like, man, I just want to go overseas. This life is so much easier. But when I get those little glimpses of when I do church here and I see or hear and, and find those people, it, like, kind of revitalizes my heart to be able to say, like, that's what it's supposed to be about, right? And we see that's what church, or that's what church planning can do, right? Um, rapid immigration. When we say rapid immigration, and we see that the numbers are increasing. This is just another quick slide. But I want to highlight this. Look at this slide, and what in particular do you see growing? And if you see it, you see a green area. What's the green area? Look at the color coding. What does it say? Immigration in particular from Asia. So why is that significant? And I will say this. You know in advance, right, so we as a generation, hopefully you guys understand this, you, you have a bicultural identity, every single one of you here do, right? So we understand what it means to be Korean. We also understand what it means to be American. And I will tell you this. You have a unique skill set because why? Most people don't know what it means to cross a culture. And again, I don't want this to make this a KP thing, like, you know, Korean pride, et cetera, because like, it's not, it's anyone who's multicultural. But I will kind of posit this understanding. One of the things we see about immigration that's going on is there's a large influx of Asians that are coming here to America. And some of you will know this just by default. All the Asians have this general understanding, right? Actually, it's funny. We came a little early, so we went to the Chinese supermarket right over here. <laughs> and it was fun because why? Because even when I checked out, they thought I was Chinese, <laughs> right? So they were talking to me in Chinese. But what's cool about that? You know this to be a fact, right? There's a certain affinity of Asians understanding you're from Asia. And regardless of whether you're the same Asian ethnic background, there's at least a general sense of trust. There's a general sense of you to be able to develop relationships with them. And again, you can go across other cultures. But I will just highlight this is to say that, again, there's also a large increase of Asian Americans coming. And in particular, by the way, these Asian Americans who are coming, a lot of these nations are what? Unreached nations. Right? So for example, use the Chinese supermarket. Chinese, huge, right? Population of people that are unreached 
And even though there's a great movement of the underground house churches in particular, but there's a huge number that are here in your backyard. And you have that opportunity to do so. So again, our time together, we're talking about call. Um, and, and as we start talking about call, which is what uh, this first session is supposed to be about. Actually, I should, uh, no, we're good. Um, so uh, when we talk about call, uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, I do think you need to have a call to church plan, right? So I don't want to remiss for this idea that I've said, hey, you know what, just go for it. Because I do want to say this to every one of you, just go for it. Because, again, I, would, I, I, I don't think, I, I was, there's so much, there's such an opportunity, there's so much of a harvest there that, again, I, I just would love to see more and more people engaged in that harvest here in the terms of church planning. But let's talk about call. And, and just recently, we've been going through a book at our men's group, uh, Eric Mason's Man Had Restored. And so I picked up this book, uh, our, uh, a statement in the book about uh, discerning God's will. And so uh, in the book, right, it's actually from uh, Discerning the Will of God by Friesen. But here's what he says, right? I'm not going to read it um, in its entirety. But he says that they speak of the will of God as a sphere rather than a dot. By seeing the, actually, we'll read it. By seeing the will of God like this, the authors emphasize that the Lord has given us multiple tools and oversight in decision making that aid in direction, in life direction and planning. They state that the best way to see the will of God in this sphere is in three contiguously smaller spheres, the sovereign will being the largest, then the moral will, then finally the individual will in the middle. But here's the point, right? And this is something that actually resonated with me. Some of the times when I think about discerning the will of God, I thought to myself, okay, like, for example, Philadelphia, it had to be Grace Point. It's the only place I could be. But what I liked about Friesen and, and kind of what the perspective was bringing about in terms of finding God's will is that if we see it not as a dot, as a sphere, there's a lot more ability for us to understand that, like, the steps we take in courage, you don't have to second-guess yourself to be able to say, well, was it the right choice? Is it the right one? Does this make sense if you guys are following me? And I think there's a great sense of gospel freedom that comes with this understanding to say, you know what, I don't have to be like, was it the right decision? Is it the right place at the right time, et cetera, and things like that. The sphere, and this is what I, I, there's other books that I can give you, by the way, about discerning God's will, and actually just for fun, uh, I'll give you a prize later if you want it, but Decision Making by the Book by Haddon Robinson, Found God's Will by John MacArthur, Finding the Will of God, A Pagan um, Notion by Bruce Walkie, and The Call by Os Guinness. Each one of these, I think, have been uh, helpful for me to discern God's will in my own life. But going back to this idea, if you're praying about church planting, I would say this. Some of the times, I think some of what we tend to do is we say, okay, is it a dot? Is it something that I have to feel like, okay, I have this absolute sense of clarity that I'm the one. And the, the, the mission field that God has called to me is that one as well. I think there's a lot of freedom in, in our understanding at the same time. There's a rough ballpark of us understanding, well, there's a sphere in which God allows us and permits for us to be able to see how God would reveal himself. Let me give you an example. So I'm a, I'm a church planner assessor for the PCA, so for Mission to North America, and I've said this last time, there's three, I, I'm going to mention this at the end, but I'll, I'm going to highlight these every single time. There's three areas that they say to define, uh, that have been a common thread for every church planter, right? Assessment, network, and coaching. So let me just say that again. Assessment, network, and coaching. If you're going to be a church planter, you, you, those three, right? So let me just kind of go through this in a nutshell, okay? Before the PCA had a, a legitimate assessment center, their failure rate, I think, was about 60 to 70% of church planners would literally go out, crash, and burn. Was not a good statistic. Now that they've done it, it's like 10 to 20, which is huge. And again, even that, something you could say to work on, but it's huge. So they, they've realized having assessment, again, being part of being plugged into a network of other like-minded church planters, and again, receiving coaching, have been the most instrumental things to see successful church plans. Those things, if you're ever going to explore, you should consider and say, those are the things we're going to need. But let me go back to assessment. So what's fun about assessment is, and literally now, you know, doing it for many years, just seeing all these guys who have come in, I've seen the entire spectrum of folks who have said, you know what, I'm a church planner. And the thing is, no two of them are alike. And that's been affirming for me. Was, you know what, when we think about this, going back to discerning your call, it's not a dot. We can't say to yourself, like, yeah, there's the quintessential kind of church planner that we think, which is like this loud, almost obnoxious, arrogant, like, you know, he comes into your room and everyone gets thrown around. And then at the same time, here's the great thing is we've also had the other ones who have actually been very, like, quiet. 
And yet what's cool is after assessment, this has been my joy, is after assessment, depending on what recommendation we give them, like I either become Facebook friends or I see them at GA, I saw a bunch of them at GA this year, and it's cool because I get to hear it's actually them saying, you know what, we left, we were friends, and now we're doing these great things for the Lord. And the thing is, they're all over the map. We do have the guys that are like really obnoxious, that are like, wow, they come in like rock stars. But we have these other guys who just have a really fervent, again, call to plant churches, and they're thriving. And it's cool because, again, for me, that says, you know what, this is the call of God in our life. It doesn't have to be something that we make it out to be like. It has to be this God. But, again, how the Lord works. So let me just kind of go over some things that I think are important. So at assessment, here's some of the things that we do, right? And I actually, I'm going to assessment next week. We're going to plant things. Uh, we're going we're gonna do some more plant, or church planters. And so at some point or another, especially if you're in the PC, I might rub into you just as an FYI. So you can say, I was at the seminar. So here we go. Um, so what are some qualifications of church planting? So, right, so he, these are qual, uh, character categories uh, that we tend to look at, especially at assessment. And so I'm giving you kind of the preview, a little bit of assessment as well. So we look at character, calling, and competency, right? And so each one of these is important. I'm gonna get again with the largest of the, of the kind of the, the building blocks of character, right? So character is important, and you hopefully will know that we live in a time, a day and age, where this is, is kind of showing its, uh, its the, the lack of character rears its ugly head, right? Moral failure, and again, make sure we don't sound the alarm too loud. Moral failure has always been part of the church. Like, it's been fun. I just finished my dissertation, and part of my dissertation was doing some historical research. In particular, I was doing research through Charles Spurgeon. Reading through Spurgeon's life was really cool because why? As the more you got to research, you realize not only was he falling, but man, all these other people were falling. Calvin, Luther, et cetera, things like that. They had all this baggage that they carried with them. Character was an issue. And, and I will say this. When you think about church planting in particular, it is important for, to know that the planter has a character that's in line with the gospel, a character that, again, doesn't, uh, is a detriment to the bride of Christ, which is the church. Actually, I'm going to give you an example, and I won't try to mention names, although some of you may figure this story out. So um, this story always kind of uh, sticks out for me. And I want to use this not as, a, as an example to deter us from thinking about church planting, but actually to prompt us toward thinking about healthy church planting. So there was a person who planted a church, really gifted guy, almost like that rock star guy that I said could come in, you know, really gifted at preaching, et cetera, and things like that. So he planted this church, long story short, grew the church rapidly, got up to about 150, 200. About a couple of years into the ministry, had moral failure. Every single one of the people in that church after it completely disbanded. And I want to say from what I, at least I hear, this is not factual, but from what I hear, at least 50% of the people that came aren't in church anymore. So here's kind of the, the hypothetical example I give, right? Was it better for him to start the church plant, gather this group of people, and now have 50% who are so scarred from the church plant that they'll probably never want to walk back into a church at least for a little while, or if not, permanent? And I say this only because it at least gives us a, a, a warning sign here to say, if you're not addressing your character before, I will guarantee you it's going to rear its ugly head in the church the same thing is true, by the way, of marriage, since we have some young folks here, right? And those of us who are married, we know this is true. Whatever baggage we carried into our marriage, we've now carried it into our offspring, to our children, right? And we know we have that. So I always tell young men, deal with your, deal with your character before, because in particular, that's going to affect more things later. Church planting, all the more is the case. If you don't deal with your character before, you're going to now affect, again, a young church. And again, what's important about that story is more often than not, what Keller and others have said is, what do church plants gather? Young believers. It's their first experience with the church. And if you scar them, again, oftentimes, again, they will not come back. So it's important for us to think about character. Secondly is calling. What I've noticed about calling is this, is that when we think about calling, it is what guides us through the darkest of nights. When I think about my seminary years, just as a quick FYI, so seminary has a big dropout rate as well. For some of you young guys, think about that. But seminary, what I've noticed is those who made it through seminary were the ones who had a deep sense of call. And so for me, it was uh, Dr. Beal's class, and it's funny because he's at West Mid now. I see him every once in a while on campus. I'm like, nightmares. <laughs> yeah, but um, his class in particular on interp was, one, was our weeder class. And I remember on those nights, again, when we were late at night studying, et cetera, and things like that, what kept the guys up was I knew where God was calling us. And I think that's true, by the way, of church planting. So character, calling, and competency. 
And competency, by the way, oftentimes where we begin with, and even this, this pyramid, just for you to think about, we tend to start at the top and then work our way down. I would encourage you to start at the bottom and work your way. Does that make sense? Like, we think, well, do I, when I think about a call to church planning, I want to begin with competencies, right? Or do I have X, Y, or Z things? And just as a quick FYI, so I'm going to borrow this literally from our assessment center. So there's a, a thing called a church leader inventory that was developed by Alan Thompson, and it's one of the tests that you do. And again, this is a great preview for those of you guys who will eventually do assessment. Um, but there's 10 dimensions that this particular exam does in terms of looking at church planners that we that they have determined to basically more or less say, these are the competencies that we're looking for. I'm just gonna give them to you, right? This isn't on your sheet, so unfortunately it's not gonna be in your thing, but I can give it to you later if you want. The first one is integrity, missional engagement, learning agility, personal spiritual dynamics, visioning capacity, family life, emotional stability, managerial courage, gospel communication, expectant of results. And what are those? Those are the competencies that basically this, this test is saying we're looking for in church planters. And, you know, just as a, as a quick kind of thought for you guys is that you should begin to think of those categories. And, and if you are thinking about competencies, you can ask those questions. Like, of those competencies, how would I rate myself? And actually, that's part of your test, really, right? You actually have to rate yourself. And just as a quick FYI, what you do is you then have six other people in your life who rate you. And that's how we get the score. I'm giving you guys all the things. Um, actually, I'm going to pause here just because I feel like it's a good place to pause before we move on. Any thoughts or questions up to this point? I told my wife it's going to be like a fire hose. You guys ready? Yes. Yeah. I would say it's a little bit of both. Um, I've actually, so I'm going to tell you how I am as a pastor. Okay, so. Uh, when we first came in particular, there was a lot of a uh, little bit of a hoopla, and so we had some people here and there who were like, oh, you know, we really like your preaching, your teaching, blah, 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 et cetera, and things like that, so we want to come to your church. And then you know, my response to them was no. <laughs> I said, don't come to our church. So if you're a faithful member of your church, we want you to be a faithful member. So we would literally turn people away. Um, now that I'm 11 years into it, et cetera, and things like that, um, it's not that I don't still turn people away. I still do, because uh, especially if they're leaving for wrong reasons, I don't want them to come. And actually, I, I'm, I'm uh, kind of the leader of our network in Philadelphia. And so uh, because I have such a close relationship with these other pastors, I'm very cognizant of the fact that transfer growth doesn't help Philadelphia. Like, it doesn't help our churches at all. Um, so I, I do think I am pretty cognizant of saying I don't want transfer growth. We get some transfer growth, yes. The pre predominant things are we do get some people who are just coming there to move into Philadelphia. It's a city, so we get people who are transient who come to the things. And we are getting new believers in terms of people that are going out and evangelizing. So our primary collegiate mission field is Arcadia University, as I had mentioned. And so we do a lot of ministry there. And then again, we do a lot of just relational evangelism through our, our, our people. So we tell them pretty regularly, you know, go and invite your friends. We have a great events. And if they're able to, you know, have them, we come to spend the sports ministries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we do a lot of that at HP. Okay. But that's been our growth. And just as a quick FYI, uh, and this, by the way, Opinions will vary on this. I'm going to tell you what I think is healthy church growth. I think healthy church growth is 10%. 10% a year. And I say that because it's manageable. Now, again, don't get me wrong. The Spirit, the Lord, and providence can do some amazing things where, like, bam, you get 100 people in, uh, like in one day. But I think more often than not, a church grows roughly by 10%, and we're able to say that you create this aspect of community that becomes important. So actually, really quick, at Grace Point, our, our three core values that I've said are gospel, community, mission, okay? So we preach the gospel every single week, right? You're going to hear it. It's a common thread that every single time you're going to have an opportunity for the believer and unbeliever like to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's community. This idea of the mega church in terms of anonymity, you're not going to have. When you come in, we want to know you. We want to know what you're struggling with, your idols, et cetera, and things like that. We want to walk with you in the midst of that. That's what it means to be a gospel community. And to me, we walk with that understanding of what it is and the mission, again, is that every one of our people go on mission, right? And again, I'm not saying we're not perfect. By no means, our church has a lot of dots, right, in terms of, I would say, our, our, I would say warts in the sense of who we are. But those are the only three things I continue to stress in our church. And I think they've been helpful in us saying that's how we grow the idea of community. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So it's 10%. So for example, uh, if you have 100 people, uh, 
uh, you should read it at the end of the year, only expect that you've added 10 more to your number. Yeah, yeah, in one year, 10% of uh, growth. Uh, that's kind of been our measurement. Um, and again, not to say that it could be more, some years it has been more. But I would say on average, it's been about 10%. And what's been actually fun, if you want to use the math, right? So, um, so I started, like I said, 11 years ago, okay? So at 10 years, that's exactly when we planted. So if you go from the zero, ground zero, add 10 each year, that's 100, you've at least doubled. And we did more than that, but all that to say is we doubled. And then what do you do when you double? Well, you go and you plant. So that's been nice for me to consider, right? And actually, I, I think I, last time I shared here, my number was 250. So my number was saying, when we reach 250 adults, I don't think you can do community the way that God desires us to do community. I think just relationally speaking, you've gone past that sphere of connections where you can say you know each other in your congregation well enough where you're praying for them, earnestly caring for them, et cetera, et cetera, walking with life together. Right? You can use Bonhoeffer's example of life together. You, you, you don't do that past 250. So again, this is an ecclesiological point driven in my understanding of church planning. And so unlike having these mega churches, my vision, my thought, and then again, this is just an opinion, so I'm not going to make this either scripture. But my opinion is continue to plant right, churches that have good community throughout the greater Philadelphia area. And some of you guys will know this. They'll say that 10 churches under 100 right, will have more impact than one mega church in any metropolitan area. So even do the math. Like, don't have these big aspirations of like, yeah, I need to be the next Tim Keller. Have the big aspiration to say, how do we create movements of that really in essence? And think about this, right? Even in terms of geography, right? This whole come to you mentality doesn't make sense because why? Because over, especially in New York, right? Like I know some of you guys traveled very far to get here, so thank you for coming. Again, just what it is. But all that to say is to travel, right, in New York City is even that much. So why think to have a church that gets bigger than instead go wider so you can reach more people? Just as a thought. Any other questions? That was to competency, but you'll see that it relates a little bit to character, right? So if you want me to, sorry, I did go read that fast. Do you guys want me to read it again? Yeah, so some of those do get in there. Actually, do uh, you want me to give you guys a quick nutshell of assessment? I, it's, I can do this, by the way. So I'll give you a quick nutshell, right? So assessment for us, at least in the PCA, is there's a group. It's a cohort. So you're in, you're in peer to peer learning. So there's, depending on the group, it's been anywhere up to like 18 couples um, all the way down to actually this round happens to be small. It's only four, right? So it's, um, uh, and, and what you do is you go and, and we do things, for example, like you, we have the COI, COSI, which the, the, uh, the, so the spouses are invited, just as a quick FYI. Uh, you can get ordained without ever having your spouse come before Presbytery, but you can't become a church planter without having your spouse come before the denomination, which is actually fascinating in its own right. All that to say is this. So your, your spouse is actually really heavily engaged in the process, which I think is more true to a biblical notion of, of what it means to be called to ministry. Uh, so your spouse will come in. You go basically through the grind. We test you on your understanding of your call. You articulate. We test you on your preaching. Uh, we test you on your ability to lead and manage teams. So we kind of do these exercises. We test you on your ability to formulate a mission plan, which is going to be our last session if we can get to it. Uh, we, we actually have you sit through a counselor. So we have a professional counselor that will sit down with you and your, your spouse. And we basically kinda, they kind of just dive in deep in terms of looking at your particular issues in terms of life things that have been brought up, whether it be through the COI, COSI, and different other reports that we get. Um, there's all these other uh, personality tests that you take before, Myers-Briggs, DISC, um, now they do a cultural competency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, it's what we would call a 360 degree grind. And actually, at the assessment center, the reason why it's critical is because you get guys who are church planters. And again, like every year, it's cool because depending on how wide the assessment is, we kind of add in, for example, the years of church planting experience. So I think one year we had like 120 years of church planning experience through all the assessors who were there just watching you, observing you, interacting with you throughout the week. And at the end, we give you a recommendation. And so that's how, that's what church planning. I will tell you this. Everyone who's come will say that they wish assessment center was ordination because it's much more thorough. For example, those skeletons in the closet in regards to character. Things, for example, let's, like, this would be a great example. I think a person can actually struggle with pornography and actually become an ordained pastor. 
but someone can't struggle with pornography and actually become a church planner. That to me is ludicrous. It, 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 we have this disparity of our understanding of leadership development that one seems at least somewhat more holistic than the other. And that to me is, you know, but so, does that help? Or, yeah. Uh, but each one of the competencies, so I would say we, we look at all those things. So there's aspects of competency that look at, but I will say I think more often than not, the very diagram that I showed, the, uh, the assessors are looking more at character, right? They are looking and examining saying in that week, and that's what's cool because they also get to see how the couples interact, right? They get to see, we will often sit with husband and wife at meals and get to know them, talk with them, et cetera, and things like that. So it's a, it's a real joy to be able to do so. And, and the great thing about assessment for me is we get to be fans. I, I love church planning because I get to be fans of them, right? So like when they start churches, I'm like, yeah, I go for it. Just out of curiosity, is anyone ever here considering going through assessment or heard about assessment? Okay, okay. good. It's great. Good stuff. Just as an FYI, I think in the PCA, there's only three Korean American assessors. <laughs> so it's pretty limited, <laughs> right? So myself, Steve, and uh, Owen, I think, are the only three. I have, and actually, so the reason, this, this is somewhat sad, I'm gonna just, I'll confess. More often than not, one of the reasons why I or Steve or Owen are invited down is because if there is someone of uh, minority uh, background, uh, they'll bring others with minority background in for that reason. Um, I have challenged our denomination in regards to that, and that, like the example I gave, and I think Owen has given this to them as well, is, you know, oftentimes imagine for a second, and we've had, for example, first generation couples even come through it, and I'm the one there, which is unfortunate because I, I speak very limited Korean, right? But um, all that to say is I said, imagine if, you know, as the token uh, only Asian person, and you're coming to a room all white, and there just happens to be one, would you really feel comfortable? And I said, let's, dr let's draw the, the contrast of that. I said, what about if it was one white couple, and it was all Asian assessors, would that person feel comfortable? And so we are addressing that. We are, I, I, let me rephrase that. I think we're working towards it. I think the PC as a whole, race relations, and as I said, race relations in America has been a big highlight. And we need to ask those things. So much to the point that if you guys know the guy named uh, Bill Sim down in Atlanta, he's actually trying to create a assessment center for first generation pastors because he feels as though the assessment center may not understand those cultural, uh, the cultural understandings or nuances. But it would be good. I, I do think, though, like, there's almost a contrast of that. Sometimes I feel like there's a lack of it. I had one guy who came out who said the same exact thing, and I was one of his assessors, and so he kind of had a beef with me. But I told him, I was like, 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 bro, I understand that. But at the same time, don't get lost in your, your anger in hearing also some of the good that they had to say. Does that make sense? Like, I don't think you have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think even with that, there's still nuances that these are veteran assessors who still have some understanding of church plans that, that I think crosses. It may not parse completely, but I think it still has wisdom there that could benefit the church plans. Any other questions? You guys need a break? Okay. 12.15? Okay. But how about... Okay. How about let's take a five minute bathroom break since everyone's going anyway. <laughs> so we'll take a quick break, five minutes, and then we'll come back.
apologies. Again, as my son said I'm talking fast, but we'll, we'll go through it. <laughs> actually, there's no apologies. It's who I am. All right. Um, I, actually, just a quick kind of story. Uh, so every once in a while, I, I find myself wanting to quote Keller, and then I, I'll try even try to mimic him. And then what I've realized over life in terms of preaching is this: you got to be who you are. And then even in terms of slowing down, like just to, just to illustrate how crazy it is, like. When I was early on in ministry, my wife literally would put up a sign, slow down. <laughs> and I would see it, and I would slow down for about a minute, and I would just go back, and she's like, I give up. You know, just be who you are, and it is, it is who I am. All right, so here we go. Uh, this is uh, something that we use as assessment. I thought it was important. And, and as you consider call, and actually, somehow I'm going to try to make it. Actually, um, actually, how about this? Let's, before we start, because i, I got to do this, otherwise I'm going to forget. So I, I wanted to bring prizes. I like giving out prizes. So even though this is a display copy, but it's from our old church bookstore, um, The Call by Os Guinness, since we're talking about call. Uh, anyone want to uh, offer one thing that they've uh, learned so far that they want to be willing to share with the group? And you get a prize. You do. No, just you just get, oh, okay. <laughs> Here's your prize. <laughs> free books, all right? Pastors, leaders, we all love free books, all right? Next one, you can, another person can volunteer. Here, so here we go. So Planter the Pastor con uh, Continuum. So this is something that's really been helpful for us to consider, which is that when we think about, like, the quintessential pastor, right, would be someone like Timothy, and Timothy was charged to really uh, get a shepherd over the flock that was in Jerry's care. The quintessential planter is the Apostle Paul. If you look at the Apostle Paul in his life, in particular look through the Gospel or, or the Book of Acts, and then you read through all of his letters, what does he do? Well, he goes in all these cities throughout Asia Minor, and he like literally just, bam, here's the Gospel, you're, you're established, alright, peace out, I'm going on to the next city, right? And he literally goes from city to city, because why? Because he's motivated by mission. Now here's the thing, what we've discovered, and this is why this is a bell curve, right, is the bell curve shows is that Typically in the church, we'll see the spectrum, right, of where people are at in terms of their gift mix, right, between pastor and, plant and, and planter. And, and believe it or not, if less than 5%, right, are on the far right, and actually I think there's uh, advanced, there we go, right, so less than 5% are on the far right as pure pastors, less than 5% are on the far left as pure planters. The majority of planters, and just actually to make sure we see this, actually really quick, see where I'm paused. Elijah, Elijah has the Wi-Fi password, if any of you guys want to download the, the, the PowerPoint now. It's, it's there. Just leave it there, Elijah. Thanks, buddy. Um, so less than 5% are on each side, and the majority of the people are in the middle, which is why, again, it's a bell curve. And believe it or not, again, where do you think most church planters come from? Where do you think? If you could put it on that, which one of the, the things? Believe it or not, it's actually somewhere right dead in the middle, which is actually you're either planter, pastor, pastor, planter, right? That's actually where the majority of our church planters are coming from. And, and what's, fa what's fascinating about that, again, is that some of the times I think when we think about church planting, again, what we want to do is that rock star. And again, those rock star kind of, uh, of planters, the guys that really are like kind of the Apostle Paul, they can literally just go gather a bunch of people around them. It's, and, and almost, by the way, the illustration I use is those are the guys when they come into a room, like literally 100 people will gather around them for no reason because they just want to listen. Those are kind of the quintessential planters, right? But more often than not, again, a lot of the planters are the ones that are somewhere in the middle in terms of their gift mix and even in terms of where they are. What I would encourage you, and this is the one I did, but just listen, you can, you can tell the graphic difference, right? Here we go. So is this, is where would you, right? Where would you, what do you guys think about your gift mix? Where would you guys put yourself? And eventually at some point when you guys have the PowerPoint, what I would encourage you guys to do is literally mark yourself. 
And actually, maybe just for fun, since we, we are a little bit interactive, why don't you go to your neighbor or go with one pair and kind of just share for a moment, where do you think you are? Just split in pairs or just people around you. Where do you think you are? All right, so generally speaking, just out of curiosity, how many of you guys are on the left side of the bell curve, the, the planter side? Raise your hand. Okay, about half. So how many of you are on the right side? The other side? Right, about half and half. Okay, so what's interesting about that, obviously, and by the way, i, I curious, anyone on the far extreme of either? Just out of curiosity, do you see yourself as further on the extreme? Okay, so that's what we're seeing a lot of them, a lot of the people are coming now, especially to assessment center, we're seeing them come much more in the middle. Um, and again, there's very few of them that we see. I mean, there's been probably like in my, and I've probably done now maybe about 40 different assessments. Um, in all the assessments, I've probably only seen one or two guys that are definitely like the pure planters, and those guys were again like the rockers that came in. Um, so th there's something for you to consider. It's, it's something for you to consider in particular in terms of your giftness, right? Like where has kind of the Lord wired you and fashioned you? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that later in terms of uh, your giftness. Um, so kind of going to the same, well, based upon that, well, what kind of leaders, what kind of church planners are we going to need, right? And so we kind of kind of dive into this idea of, well, what, what does it mean to be maintenance versus missional? And so some of you guys know the understanding of a missional church. I think we're going to talk about that more in the second session as well. Uh, but the kind of leaders that Jesus made, and what do we mean by that? Well, Jesus said this, right? He said, uh, follow, sorry, uh, these are the kind of leaders that Jesus needs. He said this, right? Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And then again, if we go tie that again to the Great Commission, go therefore make disciples. And what, at least Bruce Finn, what he does in his class, what he talks about is this. In, in the following, right, what we see is it's about three years of training, but then it's after that three years of training that you go and you then kind of go and make disciples. And then vice versa, what you do, it's this reciprocity that you keep coming back, right? Um, this next piece in terms of missional thing that I think is important, um, and this was actually part of my dissertation was considering, when we think about leadership development, how many of us have thought through, like, you know, when, when you go to seminary, and so it's actually interesting. So, Tim, you're in seminary in South, South Carolina, right? So what's fascinating about that is what? Your home is New York. Okay? And yet what seminary does for us is it takes us away from oftentimes our home mission field, and we're brought to a different place and context, and then we try to come back and have to relearn that after these three to four or five years, depending how long you did in seminary. Um, and what does it look like for us to actually do ministry as we do life and to do learning as we do life? I will say that I think leadership development models or learning models as a whole, training models as a whole, including even this, is something that we need to consider, which is what really gets us to learn. And I would even, I, I'm an education guy on the side, by the way, um, so I'm on the school board. Even the way we do education, to me, ought to change the way we do church, which is this. Nowadays, and this is something for you to consider as pastors, right? Just to make sure you get this. If someone wants to get a really good sermon on, let's say, the topic, uh, we'll use baptism just for fun, so I just talked about baptism. All you got to do is do a Google search, and bam, you can probably get the best sermon you want, and information's right there. So if you think about that, what is that doing? That's changing the way we do church, believe it or not, in terms of how we educate and train our people. Because education, in de facto, right nowadays, in the time that we're living, Information is at the tip of our fingertips, or it's at our fingertips. So now how we learn, pedagogically speaking, right, is something that we actually should consider how we also develop leaders. And I will say this. The biggest difference is what? Is actually that things that you can't do on the Internet are things like what? Real-life interaction. 
the mobile learning lab. This idea of saying that you're doing it while you're learning. And I will say that I think what's unfortunate in some ways that where the seminaries are located, et cetera, and things like that, it does take people away from having to unlearn, right, or uh, unlearn their home base, lose relationships wherever that time is, come out and, and then try to maybe come back. And some of the things that you see here in particular in New York City is what? More often than not, they won't return. Because why? Oftentimes, you go away, cost of living, et cetera, and things like that, and you come back, you're like, whoa, cost of living here is astronomical, et cetera, and things like that, and they won't return, which is why I think it's important what Tim is doing with the, with the RTS here in New York. I think it's important to consider like local-based institutions. That's just on the side, right? I'm gonna skip this video altogether, but this is Mason's vision. You guys have probably seen it. What color talking about what is a missional church? Again, I'm just gonna kind of reference it. It's there for your reference. Um, but it's a good video for you guys. To a missional it. church. Ah, sorry. Uh, so what is maintenance versus mission? Right? So a church needs missional leaders to inspire to walk together in an authentic Christian community as a witness in the neighborhood by their words and deeds uh, to their unique gr- words and deeds to the unique greatness of Jesus and his salvation. Again, we're going to kind of walk through some slides and some information for you to consider. Like what type of leader are you? Are you going to be just maintenance versus mission? Right? And maintenance, again, I will say this in regards to an EM context, more often than not, right, and this is interesting for some of you guys as EM leaders, is what we typically have been tasked to, believe it or not, is maintenance ministry. And again, not to pick on the senior pastors here, but oftentimes I remember as a youth guy or as an EM guy, I would have to be tasked with, for example, like, you know, there was a revival for the KM congregation. Well, what was I was supposed to do? I was supposed to, quote, unquote, have a youth program. When I really kind of dug down deeper, I'm going to be honest, my senior pastor admitted, he's like, no, we really just want you to babysit. It's, it's maintenance, right? And, you know, I, you, you can already tell what type of bad pastor. I was a bad guy. Sorry, Mohsen. <laughs> I, I challenged us to say, you know what? Like, don't just have us do this for the sake of maintenance. Have us actually do it for mission, for ministry, which I think is critical and important. So just to kind of have you think through this a little bit. So what is a missional? Let's draw some contrast between a missional and a uh, maintenance leader. And sorry if that's not visible. So a, a, a maintenance leader is someone who thinks of the church as a safe house for saints. A missional leader thinks of the church as a missionary outpost. Some of you guys have heard it said the other way, right? A, a church is not a museum of saints. It's a, it's, a, it's a hospital for sinners, right? So the idea is to say, you know what? A church is actually on mission. And again, for the same reason, I just came back from this trip. You know, it's cold, right? Because when I took the team, I said, hey, for this one week, be focused, be concentrated, give 110% in your entire week down in Cuba. What's fun is what? When you come back to your congregation, have it as a leadership mentality and say, you know what? We're on mission. Right? Don't do mission when you're on missions. Do missions when you're doing church. And see it in the mindset, again, that you're not, again, just having this safe place. There is, again, an ecclesiastical part of that community. They're safe, et cetera, things like that. But also challenging your people, again, to be on mission. A maintenance leader is someone who prays for the physical and material needs of church members. A missional leader prays kingdom-sized, big-box prayers for people, the church, and the neighborhood. Again, even as we think about our prayers, our prayers driven toward those outside the community. It's interesting. Um, this actually happened on Sunday. It's fun when I get illustrations that are fresh. Um, so one of our deaconesses prayed in our congregation prayer, and it was great because she never is emotional. But she got really emotional on Sunday. And she, I even texted her and said, great prayer. She got like, she replies and says, I don't know what came over, but you know what it was? He was praying actually for the community. He was praying for the world. And I thought it was cool because it was really, to me, exemplifying saying, hey, if we're going to be a missional church, we're not going to just care about us. We're going to actually care about the world. Actually, I think it was Keller who gave this illustration. I'll use it just because I think it's great. Um, so imagine for a second your church gatherings, right, and or a corporate worship service, everything can even say the same right here, right? So if a church or if a bomb were to come down on your church gathering, right, Kind of the litmus test of missional church is the saying, well, who then would miss your church if your church was obliterated? If it was church completely wiped out, who would really miss your church outside of the worship service? And I've often said that for us as a church, right? We need to make sure that we're saying, you know what? Yeah, the person down the street, the community leaders, et cetera, et cetera, they're all going to miss us because we're a presence in the community outside of our building. And that's a litmus test, I think, for every missional church still to say, you know what? If you're doing it right, you're actually going to, let me give you another litmus test, what's really fun. So I, most of the people I connect with in Philadelphia have not been because I've actually gone to other churches. You know what's been really great? The churches I really connect with are the churches I connect with on mission. So, for example, one of the missions that we, we literally are involved with was Whosoever Gospel Mission. And it's been fun because those leaders that help out at Whosoever Gospel Mission are other missional leaders. And I connect with them not, not because, again, we have the same denominational affiliation, et cetera. It's because we're on mission together. And we see our tie together in that same mindset. 
the greatest thing for me has been when you meet people on, on their mission trips. It's the same thing here, by the way. I was just down in Cuba. It was, it was great because why? I saw other churches from around the nation who were saying, we have a heart for Cuba. What's great? We're tied together with our understanding. We're not tied together because, you know, again, just because we're, but we're tied together with a common mission to see people reach in the city. And that, to me, is great. So when you think about missional leadership, be a missional leader, not a maintenance leader. A maintenance leader, again, is someone who shepherds people to get them back on their feet. A missional leader is someone who, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm back two slides. My apologies. Oh, I even missed this one. Sorry. A maintenance leader is someone who uses many uh, insider, super spiritual words. Uh, a missional leader uses language that is accessible to all. How you preach, how you teach is just as important. And, you know, some of you may know this. Uh, Jack Miller, he talks about this idea that, you know, it takes four years to graduate seminary. It takes eight years to unlearn, or, uh, yeah, yeah, to unlearn what you learn through seminary. And his point, and that's, by the way, from his book, Outgrowing the Ingrown Church, what he talks about there is this. He says, the problem with seminary is that it oftentimes teaches you a language and a culture that is so unlike the world that you forget how to interact with the world. And that's important. Because why? When you're doing church planning in particular, you're not going to deal with the people who are churched. You're going to deal with the people who are unchurched. Let me give you an example of this. I remember one time, we, so the, again, to your point, Mokhtar, about the idea of who we were reaching, we had one person who reached, she wanted to get baptized, her name was Ray, and she was going through our baptism class. And so long story short, one of the first sessions I'm sitting down with her, she was like, Pastor Rob, I just have a question for you. It's like, what are you mentioning this guy Paul? Did I meet him in the church? And I was like, oh, like her framework, her entire framework of scripture was, she had no understanding who the Apostle Paul was. And, and I will say that was a, a, a clarifying moment for me as a church planter because I came back and I said, you know what? I can't come with the assumption or the presumption that people even know this truth. When you're preaching and when you're teaching, how do you come with the understanding that people are at ground zero and you're literally building these things afresh? So the language we use becomes very particular in terms of how we church plant and all the more so, again, for missional leaders in, in understanding that. Uh, and that's really difficult, again, especially if you come in my camp, right? So you have this Reformed Presbyterian camp that values its theology. But I will say this. I think it's important. I think the best people understand theology but actually know how to bring it down in common day terms. Actually, I will say this to kudos to Cutler. Not to say Cutler is, is God, by the way. He's just as flawed as everyone else. But one of his gifts, in my opinion, is what? Is he speaks deep spiritual truths in everyday language. You know who else did that well? Jesus. Why did he use parables? Deep spiritual truths, like uh, truths in everyday language, everyday illustrations that people understand. And I think Christ exemplified even this very idea of what it meant to be a missional leader, right? Obviously, there's other things beyond that. Um, but going forward, right? A, a, a maintenance leader does what? Shepherds people to get them back on their feet. A missional leader shepherds people to get them back on the front lines. Again, a missional leader actually challenges their people to go on the front lines to actually go and, and make sure that they're not, um, you know, comfortable in their faith. Just as a quick kind of statistic to give you guys. Um, again, I think this is coming from Keller. I know it's going to sound like I, I worship him, but I don't. But he, he says this, right? After, I think, three to four years, the average believer loses most missional context of unbelievers, right? And so as a result of it, think about it. Like, if you're a believer for now, however many years that you are, most of your context, right, your deep, intimate, personal context, you're no longer with unbelievers. So that's a, that's a positive, to church, that's a, it's an encouragement to church plant. But then there also is an encouragement then, in my opinion, you, you don't just have to leave them to the wayside. You actually have to challenge your congregation to say, hey, you know what? If all you're surrounding yourself with is other Christians, you're no longer doing the mission to which God has called you to. Right? And, and actually, I'm going to give you a quick illustration, which is fascinating for a lot of reasons, because I just talked to a friend of mine about this. So one of the illustrations I used to give was saying, hey, you know what? When we think about, like, for example, the whole LGBTQ uh, you know, agenda today, I used to challenge people in the church and say, you know what? Like, how many of you have a deep personal contact with someone in the LGBTQ community? Someone that you wouldn't say is just a stranger, like someone you know about, but someone you actually know, and you're caring for them, you call them your friend. And I will say that's important. I think that's something that, as leaders today, if there's going to be, there's a couple issues that are going to address this as a church. That one is huge, and obviously the race issue is going to be huge in the next couple of years. And so our ability to articulate a position that becomes not only gospel-centered, but one in which we can clearly demonstrate, again, speaks both truth and grace at the same time is one that's going to be critical. But as a missional leader, you're actually saying, you know what? You're going to challenge yourself, first and foremost, but then also your congregation, begin to develop these personal relationships. Care for your neighbors. Care for the people. You and so it was great. One example that I gave typically was 
uh, I used to go to Supercuts, but it's funny because I don't get them too cheap, but all that to say is this, I used to go to Supercuts, and my barber was gay. It was opening day, and it was great because why? Every single time I came in, he knew my number. He goes, I saw you put my number in my system. And his name was Reyes, and it was cool because he was a Catholic guy, born and raised in Philadelphia, et cetera, and things like that. Struggles to do these things, so he's not accepted. But whenever I came in, oftentimes I came in before a wedding, I was just able to talk with him. Again, we, it never went beyond all those things, but that was great because one, he knew I would listen, he knew I could, he knew who I was, but he also had my number of phone to show me everything about his life, his, how his family doesn't accept his partner, et cetera, and things like that, and it was great. It was one of the most meaningful relationships I had with someone in that community just to care for. Again, differences aside, just caring for him as a person, being a friend to him, which I think is important. Um, just a quick FYI, uh, my buddy and I, we shared recently, it was actually at GA, we were talking saying how it's crazy that now that question no longer becomes relevant because most of us in our intimate circles know someone. We have someone who's dealing or struggling with this. And that, by the way, is in a period of a five-year time that that illustration has changed. And it's changing because of our culture. That's just as an FYI, all right? Um, moving forward. Ask me questions at the end. I, I hope that there'll be some questions about that. Uh, beyond front lines, right? So a maintenance leader is someone who leads information-oriented Bible studies. A mission leader leads countercultural Christian community. Uh, next one. A, mission, a maintenance leader connects, sorry, connects with those who are in his own tribe. A mission leader connects with believers beyond his tribe. And we were just talking about this, Pastor James and I were talking about this in terms of just saying, well, yeah, you can all have your camps, right? Meaning you can have your people that you, you float with, right? Your PCA folks, your Baptist folks, your, you know, full gospel folks, whoever it might be. But I will say that the kingdom, and, and hopefully you're not so narrow in saying that the kingdom is only going to be for the reformed people, right? But you're actually saying the kingdom is wider and broader. And so our expression, again, it doesn't mean we have to agree, but it does believe that we are in the same kingdom. We're part of this missional building activity together. And actually, I will say this. What Paul, the Apostle Paul, since I didn't have a reference for my illustration, the Apostle Paul says is that we are co-laborers together in the same harvest field. So if you're working together but you don't have relationships, that doesn't make sense, right? So you need to make sure you're building these relationships with people outside your tribe. I don't know how you do it personally in terms of if you do it, but I would make that as a strong exhortation to say don't be maintenance in terms of just saying, well, it's about my denomination or it's about my own church. Actually, I'll tell you right now, this, this network that I do, it's been really great because this year I decided, hey, let's make this switch. Instead of meeting quarterly, which is what we did, and I have to pull people to do it and have them volunteer, I said, hey, let's walk in faith. So this year in Philadelphia, I said, let's meet monthly, first Thursdays of every month. I said, I'm going to ask you all this time just to volunteer, and it was great. Within a week, right, and it's funny because Dan's church here uh, was too late in responding, but in a week, I had every single church say, yes, I'm willing to be a part of this. I want to encourage it. I want to support it. I want to see something, God do something great. This is a contrast after 10 years of literally pulling teeth, in my opinion that at least I see some sense of response to saying, hey, you know what, we're in this together. We're all doing this together. And again, this is cross-denominational. It ranges from, again, some form of a non-denominational pre Presbyterian, full gospel, et cetera, and things like that. But they're all willing to say, hey, we're in this together. How do we encourage each other? And that's the modus of the network, which is saying we just want to encourage you. We're not competing against each other. We're actually just encouraging each other to do the mission to what God has called us to. I don't know if you have that mindset, but I would encourage you, foster that. Like the church down the street, remember, keep in mind, they're not the enemy. The enemy is, you know, as Paul says, it's a spiritual battle, right? Against, you know, spiritual uh, realms, et cetera, and things like that. It's not against flesh, but it's not against, you know, the other denomination. They're on our side, right? The other thing is greater that we need to be worried about, and it's oftentimes I think we get consumed with our tribal kind of mindset, all right? Um, lastly, uh, a missional leader, sorry, uh, a maintenance leader, uh, preaches that non-believers of self-righteousness, a mission leader spreads the gospel relationally, respectfully. And you guys already got what I said earlier. Um, any comments really quick or thoughts on maintenance versus missional? You guys see the difference? Yes? Uh, you guys, go ahead. So what we've tried to do, and this is just information sharing for you guys, um, is I've tried to draw what I call a funnel diagram. 
right? And the funnel diagram has, again, the largest concentric circle on the outside, but it goes down, right? And it filters down. And so um, even, uh, what's his name, Rick Warren has kind of the base, bases analogy in terms of different things. Um, for me, I, I think the funnel analogy kind of plays well in the sense of where what I want to see is an intake of how people come into our church, circle in, but how do we get them deeper into the things? And so what we've said and we've tried to draw is, you know, there's a general sense of community groups, right, or growth groups is what we call them. And then we have the inner circles of things like officer training, discipleship, um, that are more for that information dissemination that people are pursuing. And at the very bottom, it's that officer training, right, and the officer training, or as you said, there's like baptism training and other discipleship and then officer training at the end. And the challenge of the officers is to go back on the outside, and if you're, for example, a good elder, you're not just going to shepherd, but you're going to be one of the primary mission gatherers because you're going to bring them back into that funnel and bring them back down. Uh, right? Warren's example is go through the bases and then run through the bases with another person. Right? I think both analogies work in the sense of creating some form of a cycle. Um, I will say, if you're thinking about visioning capacity, I think it's important for us as leaders to think through that in terms of the nature of your church, which is saying, how do people really come in, like pathways? Like I'm asking this question all the time, in particular actually, so this is one of the big questions I ask our leadership. I, I really want us to develop with our expression in the African American community, and we've had a good number of visitors throughout the years. Um, but what we're gathering are African African Americans, like from Africa, and they love our church, our expression, et cetera, and things like that. But what I'm asking about is, well, what about like the urban, the hip hop, the, you know, the, the really, you know, th that type of expression, that becomes, They've come, and in times they've really enjoyed it, but they don't stay and make it their home. And so I'm asking those deeper questions of, well, how do we get them from, again, just coming as a visitor, and that's that idea of a funnel diagram, where we get them deeper in. So, Because once you know they develop a solid relationship with someone in the church, they make it their home, right? So how do we get them to be able to do that? Those are kind of the things I'm asking. I don't know all the answers. I don't know the answer to that because we haven't solved it. But does that help answer your question? Any other? Yeah, so I want to say, at first, uh, and not at first, at one point, we probably teetered to 70, 30, 60, 40, uh, Asian American to non-Asian American, whatever the other Asian American or non-Asian is. Typically, it was oftentimes Caucasian, uh, but it was also other, for example, like, at one point it was. I, I think when we, plant, when we finally planted, we actually reverted a little bit, and actually, this is something of a concern for me, which is we probably went back to 80, 20, so it still looks very multi-ethnic, which is actually, just as a quick FYI, Mosaic, which is um, a, a great multicultural ministry um, out in Nebraska, I think. Um, Mark Dimas, right, is his name. Um, they use the rubric of 80 to 20. It's, once you get past that 20% threshold, uh, you are multicultural is what they would call it. And I, I say that only because when it gets past that 20%, you don't feel like a minority anymore because you feel like you belong. When you're under that 20%, you feel singled out. Going back to your assessment, when you're that only Asian or that only minority, you're going to feel awkward because you no longer are part of any sense of majority or you don't feel a sense of majority. Um, the daughter church, um, Pastor Paul is much more Korean than I am, even though he's younger, right? And so I was born and raised in Hong Beach, kind of a surf boy, even though I don't surf, but grew up amongst all kind of ethnicities. So to me, I think my cultural affinity is very different than his. So I think we're more multi-ethnic than he is, although his percentages are probably pretty close because th the people we sent were pretty close. Um, a case in point, in 2012 at Grace Point, we, I did 12 weddings in 2012. I remember because it was a, kind of a, a historic year of all the lot of weddings. The 12 weddings, of the weddings that I did that year, six of them were multi-ethnic, or, or were bicultural weddings. And again, I think, again, going to the times, signs of the times, I think New York may be a little different, although I, I'm sure over time, especially as secularization continues to happen, as cities become more melting pots, you're going to see the same exact kind of curve. You know, I think the ability of multiculturalism here will be more important and significant than even what we're experiencing so long. But I, I would want to teeter the other way, obviously. I don't want us to revert back. I think some of that, believe it or not, goes back to staffing. And actually, just again, all cards on the table. I, I think what's hard for the church today is like we put out ads for all of our positions um, and stuff like that. So typically speaking, the affinity for people to come to Grace Point, it tends to draw like-minded folk. I, personally speaking, when we've hired certain people, so for example, our assistant happens to be Korean American. I actually told him very honestly in my interview, this is probably, this is not, this is definitely not PC today. 
I told him, I said, your biggest detriment is the fact that you're Korean. I actually wish that you weren't Korean. Like, you know what I mean? And, and I said it very honestly. Like, so it, you can't say that in an HR interview today, right? That's what I mean, right? But my point being is that, like, if he had all the gifts but working in a different skin, I would have probably appreciated it more because I feel like I want us to push that, right? And so at one point, in fact, our children's director is African-American. She's from Nigeria. Um, our church planning intern is like a mix of things, but Puerto Rican is his primary mix. But the point being is we're trying to be somewhat intentional about our hiring practices. So I think it is important for churches to say, you can't expect multiculturalism if you're not also willing to hire people from that. Now here's my tension. I do think we're living in a time, a day and age, where they're wondering, people are wondering, again, it's easier for, and this is putting all the race cards on the table, for an Asian American to go under a Anglo pastor it is much harder for a, a, a Anglo person to come under an Asian American pastor. Uh, uh, it's, not the tr it's not the white elephant in the room, but it's at least something to consider, which is, again, how we lead. And actually, going back, I was talking to someone about business principles. As Asian Americans, we, I don't think we know how to lead organizations well yet. Like when I talk about that leadership development gap, and we have a huge gap as to where we are in terms of in that development. So a case in point, like, so I'm, I'm thinking about doing an MBA purely for that reason, right? Because I think how I manage my staff, which I know I have a lot of flaws with, it, it's something that I, I want to grow in to be able to say that I can not only manage, but more or less kind of develop to a degree that goes beyond what we're doing now. I think we're doing it, but I want to do it more so. I want to see how we can develop leaders by having them on staff and that by building them up so we can do other things. Like for example, my interactions with Paul, I think are one where I'm saying like, we meet every week, I'm trying to encourage him. Again, the vision for planting churches, again, the vision for multiculturalism. I ask him these questions, like how, do you, how are you gonna get there? What are you gonna do to do So I, I think we do that, but I think we need to do a better job with that. Yeah? So some of them did. Um, the, ch the children's one um, happened to be a family that came. She happened to graduate West Maine with a counseling degree, and so it was really great. Providentially, her husband uh, was part of an African American church. They didn't feel they uh, it was like the African American church has its own issues, and so they left because of a lot of uh, bureaucracy and issues that they faced. They found Grace Point to be really refreshing, literally quote unquote. They said it's the closest church that reminds them to their church in Nigeria. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but they said. <laughs> This feels like home for us, and so I said, great, come on over. And, um, and then over time, when we needed a children's person, we said, hey, Esther, would you consider it? She said, yeah, more than one. She's great. I mean, uh, it's really, uh, it's refreshing to be able to have their family in our midst, um, and we really have it. Um, the, the Westminster student actually happens to be a Redeemer product, um, and so the, Chris, who's our church planning apprentice, um, and it happened to be by means of just different relationships, and when he was considering a call to ministry, we said, hey, why don't you come? And he wants to go to seminary, so it worked out well that he came to there, and we basically incubated him to be a church planter. And, and what's funny is, so it's all the experiences, I think if you were to talk to him, it'd been great. He's been able to come, have mentorship, be at seminary, actually see us plant a church. I mean, you can't imagine an apprenticeship better than actually seeing us plant a church, hiring a church planter, being able to see how that forms and gets shaped. Um, but then right now, he's actually considering a call to Japan as a counselor, which is kind of interesting, because he has his PhD in counseling, late fall. But that's how we found them. It was kind of by providence. I, I will say that in the church, I would love to see them homegrown. So if we do have leaders that are aspiring, actually going back to the incubation system or the farm system, I do think that's important. Like indigenous leadership is huge. And actually, just as a quick FYI in Philadelphia, you know, I see myself as a outsider coming in. I have challenged Philadelphians, like lo local native indigenous Philadelphians. I said, you take the helm. Actually, Paul is a native indigenous, indigenous Philadelphian. I want him to literally lead and vision. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be a starter. I think I'm an opportunity network, a visionary, visionary guy, et cetera, and things like that. But I want the indigenous guys to do it because again, let's use the comparison, right? If I were to go to Kenya as an example, if I'm gonna make lasting impact change, I know my life and my time and my understanding of the culture is always gonna be limited. It's the guys that are native that are gonna be like, these are the guys that need to own the land, right? And I think that's critical in particular for New York, right? So. You, I'm sure the same disparity is going to happen here. Like, you can get an outside guy to come in and plant churches and do movements, et cetera, and things like that. But you all know New York better than I will ever know New York, 
right? Because I can get my gathering, I can do my studies of people, et cetera, things like that, or New Jersey for that matter, whatever, this area, right? Like, you guys know it more because this is your area. Now you kind of have to take ownership. Actually, this is gonna, I'm going to preview a little bit my second part of the presentation. But part of that presentation is going to be on owning the mission field, right? Like, take seriously your, your understanding. Like, this is my harvest field. Like, I want to reap that harvest. I don't want anyone else to reap that harvest. This is like, this is what God has placed me, right? And if that's the case, right, it's kind of how my daughter, she takes pride in our little garden. She gets the joy of reaping. Right? I want to see indigenous people take joy of reaping the harvest that God has right in front of me. So I'm, I'm pretty keen on this idea of trying to create indigenous leadership. So hiring Paul, bringing him back, he was in California, which is ironic, but bringing him back was pretty critical to that piece. So Dan's an indigenous Philadelphia guy. Some of you guys are indigenous New York guys. Own your land. Support it. Cool. Okay, can I go forward? It's 12.15 past four. Are we good? Okay. Yeah, can I go for 15 and then just finish? this first session, otherwise I'm going to feel bad that we only did one session in this entire time. Because my, I'm a type A guy, as you can tell, um, so it irks me that if I don't finish, I'm probably not going to finish, I'm going to be honest with you guys, especially because of time constraints, but uh, feel free to have all the resources. So let's talk about really quick, uh, DNA, your gifts, your talents, right, because that's where we're at next. So your gifts and your talents, do you know them and are you using them? So I'm going to show you this quick video because I love this video. Um, Oftentimes, I think we do need to ask that question of like your, your competencies, as we talked about earlier, but your, your fit, right, with your giftedness. Um, I was telling Dan on the way here, I, I believe that young leaders today, one of the things we lack in, and actually it's kind of funny, this has been kind of the, the hype word. This is actually making its way even through our education system. Emotional intelligence is one of them, but just I would even argue this idea of being self-aware. As leaders, I don't think we're very self-aware sometimes of our own gifts, our talents, and even, for example, the call to which we find ourselves to go pursue. And so, for example, the illustration I always give is kind of square peg, round hole. Like, you're trying to fit yourself into a position that you know won't work. Like, I'm going to case in point, like, again, I'm gonna, this is not, by the way, I need to say this. Actually, it's, it's Pastor Paul's brother, uh, Min Chang, who actually gave me this. I, I've always used because I was meeting with him one time. And you know, one of the things we said was, yeah, churches like Grace Point are great, and don't get me wrong, and there's other churches like that, but what we said was, but all churches are needed. And I completely agree. You need to have the KM model, you need to have the EM model, you need to have you know, X, Y, or Z, you know, co-dependence, co et cetera. All those churches are good, because why? Because we need all those churches to reach all the people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't believe that just one church. No singular church is gonna be able to, and every church has its own missional niche, right? They can all reach different people. A CAM context is going to reach certain people that feel very extremely comfortable, and praise God, even unbelievers are going to be reached as a result. But at the same time, right, we need to also realize that you got to look at your giftness and say, you know what, don't continue to go into, for example, places where your gifts and talents are going to be like that square peg round hole, because why? Ultimately, at the end of the day, and what I gave Dan as an illustration was, is that it's going to cause damage to yourself as a leader, but it's also going to cause damage to the ecosystem which you're trying to plug in. And that's important for you to keep in mind. So actually, this video illustrates it. So watch this very quick. Once upon a time, the animals were sent off to school to learn swimming, running, climbing, and flying. All the animals had to take all the classes. The duck was very good at swimming. She was even better than the teacher. But she was so bad at running, she had to stay after school to practice. She tried and tried, till her webbed feet got all worn out. Then she couldn't swim very well. No one seemed to mind, except the duck. The squirrel was at the top of his climbing class, but not so good at flying. After many hard landings, he couldn't climb very well. No one seemed to mind, except the squirrel. The eagle was a problem student. In the climbing class, she beat everyone to the top of the tree because she insisted on going there her own way. That got her into trouble. They made her climb like the others. They didn't mind, but the eagle did. Each of the animals was good at something. God designed them that way. When they had to do what they weren't designed to do, it hurt them. But when they were free to do what they were designed to do, they did very, very well. And again, as simple as that is, right? And I love that video, by the way. I, I saw that video like 30 years ago. <laughs> but, um, really quick. 
so when you think about it, right, like, you all have gifts. You all have talents. And, and just to affirm this, right, anyone called to ministry, uh, be affirmed in this understanding, be encouraged in this understanding that God has gifted you with gifts and talents for the sake of his kingdom for ministry. There's not one of us that lacks in giftedness. Now, there's varied gifts, right? Eagles, the turtles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's varied gifts. But each one of us has gifts that God has given for the purpose of flourishing his kingdom in that particular way. But going back to this, though, in terms of calling, what I think is important, though, is you need to ask yourself, is in your gift mix, right, how are those being employed? Because, again, even as the video exemplified, right, if you're using it contrary to your purpose, it's not going to help you, nor, again, will it help its organization. So you do have to ask yourself in terms of fit, like, does the pursuit of my call fit in, even using that sphere analogy that we talked about, in the pursuit of that call that I believe that God's given to me, is it a correct fit? Do I believe that what God has gifted me and talented me for the purpose of his kingdom, does it really align well? Because again, if you're going to begin to feel like it's square peg round hole, and this is what we see happening, some of you guys will know, again, the average time of a pastor at most Korean churches is what? Two to three years, right? Why? By the way, just as an FYI, superintendents of school districts is the same exact thing as an FYI. But why is that the case, right? I think because oftentimes what we see is, it's because we're trying to fit these things in, and that's the amount of time that you give yourself to try to fit, and you realize it doesn't work, so then you move on after. But the reality is, you could ask yourself, is, is there an exact call to how God has wired me, fashioned me, gifted me, etc., so that I can go and pursue things accordingly? And I will say this for me, at least, and this is, again, I, and this is an IMO, in my opinion, right? Church planting happened to fit perfectly with how God had wired me. Did not know, because before it was all about, even kind of, you want to go back, piece the timeline together, right? Actually, I can give you a lot of my timeline, but let me just do aspects of my timeline. Broken family, independent, self-worker, you know, uh, gritty guy who worked all these different jobs, you know, when it came down to uh, wanting to start businesses, et cetera, had different aspirations and dreams, you know, going to seminary, starting ministries, seeing them pass and built Rise Ministry up in, in Boston, which is something that Wanjay and I did back in the day. It's great. It's going on 20 years now. We started, we left it, we left it to be what it is, and God's faithfulness, it continues to work. I'm piecing these things together, and then kind of the missions thing was like, hey, I love reaching on unbelievers. I love this thrill of being able to preach, not again to believers, but unbelievers, and then kind of when the call to church planning came, I was like, yeah, I felt like, God, this is exactly how you wired me and how you fashioned me. And it's been affirming because one of the things about assessment is that, you know, Bill Crispin, who's like kind of the church planning guru in Philadelphia, he was like, Robert, like, I don't know what you've ever thought, but you are the, like, you're the one guy that I've seen among Asian Americans in particular that can do this because of all these aspects in terms of your life. And he's basically just affirmed, saying, this is how God has wired you. Continue to fan into flame the gifts in which God has given you. And I will tell you that, again, you need to consider, like, this aspect of who you are in that way. And so kind of these things really quick. I'm going to go through these, fly through these. Again, lunch is waiting. Knowing, being, doing, consider what it means in terms of what that is. Um, this whole idea of type perspectivalism I think is important. The other way you can examine it is uh, look at your gift mix in terms of prophet, priest, and king, right? Um, just as a quick FYI. These are things in which I know other people have maybe perhaps thought, but you should consider, like, well, what's your gift mix? And actually, just for fun, I'm not going to do the exercise because of time, but you should see yourself in terms of asking yourself, well, in top, bottom order, what, what is your gift mix? So, for example, mine is a prophet, king, priest. That's my gift mix. At some point, maybe over lunch, you guys can share with each other, well, what's your dominant to weakest in terms of organization? So just as an FYI, actually, I'll tell you this. So we hired Pastor Tom, who's my assistant pastor, and why did we hire him? Because ultimately, as the church grew, and as I did other things, especially outside the church, whether it be leadership development, networking, school board, et cetera, and things like that, some of the shepherding kind of fell to the wayside. And just, again, full cards on the table. When it comes down to shepherding, it's not my gift, even though I do it. I do it, I think, somewhat well, but at the end of the day, it's more taxing on because right, I love connecting, I love networking, I love visioning all these things. But when it comes down to like the day-to-day hand-holding, counseling, et cetera, that actually drains me completely. So when I come back, and actually I'm right now in the middle of a pretty severe counseling situation, like just talking for two hours on the phone with a deep counseling situation, like it takes me a while to recover from that conversation because it weighs on me. And so what's great is I basically said, hey, you know what? This, this whole you know, priestly duty which in particular is my weakness, and just as a quick FYI, the PCA's motto more or less is always hire according to your weaknesses, don't hire similarity. So we basically hired this guy, why? Because he has a big shepherd's heart. He's like a kid's kid, right? So he loves being with people. He loves hanging with people. Why do we hire him? Because he's a priestly guy, right? So he loved that. So I'm thinking through these things even in terms of our gift mix. So 
Frothy pre-skinning, you can dip, do up in ways. I'm going to skip through that, um, but it's there for your thing. Another, just a quick, these are just tools. And now I'm giving you tools, all right? Another tool that you can consider is Myers-Briggs, right? Most of you guys know this in terms of like ISTJ, which is my predominant one. Just recently, I'm now an ESTJ, which is uh, changing. This is something that we use at assessment. And this is knowing who you are. I'm, these are just tools about knowing who you are. I, I highly value these just because I think they're important. DISC, dominant, influence, steady, compliant. Um, just as a quick FYI, the common, uh, the common, most common uh, gift mix that we see for church planters, uh, believe it or not, are DIs, okay? Just as an FYI. For me, I'm a DC, okay, in terms of my gift mix. Uh, if you were to Google, you can find out all these online tests, they're there. Uh, if you go through assessment, this is actually gonna be a part of it. Here's another kind of slide just showing uh, what it really means in terms of people orientation, tasks, et cetera, and things like that. If you do get the report, um, sorry, if you do get the report, the report will look something like this, because there's very degrees of how you actually come out on your disc, um, which is important. And I think, believe it or not, actually I thought it was gonna be more, but there's not. Um, so that's call in a nutshell. These, these, these tools though, we do give to you at assessment. I know this is not an advertisement for assessment, although you can go through assessment. Um, but I think they're important even now to begin to discover your awareness of your gifts, right? Because your gifts, your wiring, how you're, you're called in that way, or how you're wired will partly relay into your understanding of your call as well. Okay? Very good. Any questions? Lunchtime. Actually, sorry. And let me just go back again to this. So again, assessment, coaching, network. I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna hammer these things through because again, these have been again, the proven, the proven things that have determined more or less successfulness in church planting than anything else. Assessment, coaching, networking. Have those be memorized in terms of things that you are can say in church planting you're gonna have in your life, okay? Not quite it. Hey, so that's good. Pastor Paul, you wanna tell us how lunch is gonna be done? <laughs>